morning, everybody. So today, I'll be talking about a um, very interesting topic of solar system formation, quantum vibration, and natural disaster. What motivates me into this research is mainly the topic of natural disaster. I would like to be able to predict when all those major uh, natural disasters will occur in the future. And that leads me to understanding uh, the connections between uh, space weather and all the climate change and many other activities on Earth. And that also leads me to uh, conducting more intensive research on how uh, solar activities arise and also go all the way into how the solar system will form. So hopefully this will be uh, an interesting uh, topic to discuss and be beneficial to everyone here. So I would like to start with the term simplicities. So in order for human to understand anything and be able to implement what they understand, it starts with really simple concept, such as if we understand how the bird flies, we can actually imitate birds and build a flying machine. If we understand the wheel, how the wheels work, we cre can create a vertical. So in this case, we want to understand how natural disasters occur, and we have to use a simple concept to understand this. So what means simple is mean it's simple to observe. Anyone can observe what I observed through all the perceptions that everyone has. And also, in terms of natural disaster, the observation is just a pure, simple observation, such as rain, floods, tornadoes formations, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions. And these are natural observations. There's more artificial uh, observations that human have come up with, such as fluctuation of magnetic fields, electric fields, and all kinds of stuff, which are the secondary observation that not many people can observe such change by themselves. It relies on scientific instruments. Uh, same thing for the sun. The natural way to observe the sun, well, back like hundreds of years, thousands of years, is through sunspots. And of course, using really simple instruments, uh, scientists and astronomers can uh, generate a sunspot index called sunspot number, and that can be highly beneficial to understand the sun, simple as that, in addition to a more complex index, such as solar flares, you know, geomagnetic storm, or coronal holes, coronal mass ejections, and so forth. And of course, it has to be simple to reproduce and verify, just like uh, I have mentioned, it has to be natural. Uh, something everyone can do, and it's not too expensive to do it. So we don't need billions of dollars to prove something the way it is. It's just how we see things. And of course, what we see is what we get. It's a direct conclusion based on direct observation. We can also conduct physical experiments just to confirm that we understand um, the behavior of what we try to observe. And of course, it's based on personal experience that we gain over, you know, from our child ages to now. So in order to work in the right direction, we need the right perceptions. And in order to do that, I need to rely on the teaching from great philosophers and scholars around the world that's living today in this room, as well as those you know, that live in the past thousands of years. And they all come to 
really the same conclusion when we want to observe something, that everything has to happen for a reason. They have to have cause and effects, and of course, how do you define cause and effects? In general sense, we use the term dependent origination, that all things arise in dependence upon multiple cause and condition, not a single one. For example, I was born, I cannot born by myself. I rely on my mother and my father, and of course, my father and my mother cannot be born if they don't have air, food, and water supplying to them. So everything depends on each other. There's no single isolated island of anything that's causing something. So everything is all conditioned. And of course, if we want to study something and to be pretty much neutral or not biased, we always, we always see something in dualities, just like we see a coin. It always has two sides. And of course, uh, we see things the way it is. Simple to say, but what I mean is everything is subject to change. For example, this universe, assumption that this universe is electrically neutral is also impermanent. Same thing for electrically biased. It's also impermanent. There's nothing really constant or stay the same way without changing. And of course, since everything is conditioned, there's no something dictating everything ultimately. So there's no, no true essence in what we actually observed. And that, in general sense, is called a uh, concept, non-self. So next. Okay, so now we go to the topic of quantum vibration. Um, the simple concept of this term, I refer to the minimum amount of physical entity involved in an interaction. So in, in this case, what we can do in this universe is all about changing. Depending on what we're actually looking at and pay attention to, there's always at least two states that we can define out what we observed. For example, if we look at charge, we can see positive charge and negative charge. If we want to look at um, electricity, uh, they are electromagnetic and electrostatic. If we want to study wave, there's two types of waves. There's transverse wave and longitude wave. Um, if you look, want to look at how matter's movements, it can be perceived as contraction or expansion, and also can arise from chaos into order and vice versa. And this is just some example of what you can see and perceive in reality. And all of this exists in all state of matter. Plasma, gas, liquid, and solid. And of course, all of these properties exist in space, or someone can call this vacuum. It's an ever-changing environment. So next, we're going to the main concept of this presentation. So I need to uh, get obtain some guidance from uh, one of the great scholars here, which is Nik Nikola Tesla. One of his code is, if you want to find the secret of the universe, we think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. And of course, in this conference, we refer energy, uh, want to focus on electrical energy. So we go into the, the first experiment, of how we try to create a, a plasma ball, okay, using electrical potential. This is a brute force way to create uh, a plasma ball so we can 
learn and understand how, we, how the plasma behave as a spherical shape. So in this case, we have um, a, a tube, a vacuum tube. We supply nine kilovolts uh, AC power into uh, the one electrodes at the center, and there's one side uh, on the, another plate. And then we start by vacuum the tube out, so we create a, a, a easy condition to produce plasma. So from here, just pay attention to um, the video here. So the, the power is already supplied to this tube, and of course, once the condition is right, you have a plasma sphere create a center of the chamber. So this looks pretty much like the sun, but of course the sun has more complex behavior than this. So one I want, the one I want to show you is you can see the plume um, that's showing up here. Um, and that's kind of similar way that we observed in this plasma ball. So the point I'm trying to make here is that if you wait a little bit longer, we want to change the conditions surrounding this plasma ball and see how the plasma ball behave um, according to this change. In this case, we leak the air. You can leak the air inside this plasma ball, this plasma chamber. And if you wait a little bit more, you notice something change to this sphere. Right now, it's not changing yet. Let's keep observing a little bit. <laughs> now, start to change. See how activities start to increase? So that's when uh, we have um, more uh, massive gas leaking into the system, so the different plasma density in the chamber. And you could also notice the uniform glow at the edge of the plate. So from here, we go into uh, conclusion. Um, this is just not the whole complete picture of the sun, but I, the point I'm trying to make here is that the sun is not the sun by itself. The activity of the sun was not dictated from the, the thing that's come from inside, as, but in this case, is, it does have the outside influence of the activity. So during the high vacuum pressure chamber, it looks like uh, so high soil activity. And uh, there's more filaments like, because there's more uh, gas inside, there's more electrical discharge activities become more frequent. And of course, you have more magnetic field, you have more currents, and this is called this solar maximum uh, in my opinion. Uh, of course, and of course, it produce uh, high X-ray emissions, more frequency, and of course, high number of sunspots. On the other hand, in, when during the low vacuum pressure, um, the plasma will become more uniform and it's very really similar to the low soil activity cycles. And it looks like less filaments like electrical discharge activities, weaker magnetic field, all those flux lines are less present. Could be, we can define as strong electric ac activities, solar minimum, and low X-ray emission. So, of course, we define this as a low number of sunspots. So this is going to one of the factors that I actually use for understanding how the, this plasma density affects the sun as well as the Earth in general. So next slide. Of course, if you want to compare this to the other age of the solar system, this is what I believe, uh, something using a really cheap way to generate it looks like a hill of pause to me. Um, I believe this is um, very similar to what Rob Jergen maybe have visualized, maybe. 
And uh, he, what, what he said is uh, the sun itself is a focus of cosmic electrical discharge. So we just do just that. But this is a brute force way to uh, fuse the plasma into the center of the sphere. And of course, there's more efficient way to do that is to resonance system. So now we move through uh, going through uh, more factor details of how we can create a system that mimics the sun through quantum vibrations. Now, in, and introduce the terms uh, frequency and vibration. And of course, to, do, to understand this, and may be hard to do in plasma, plasma medium, I choose to uh, learn uh, this type of behavior from uh, the work from Dr. Han Jenny, which is what he does is uh, he make an experiment on a membrane full of very fine powder. He puts uh, acoustic wave um, perpendicular to this diaphragm. So it creates vibrations on this vibrain. So from here, you start to see that um, material start to condense at the center of the things, and you see it's, it looks spherical, just like the sun. And of course, if you zoom inside, you start to see circulations, uh, convection, that is occurring in this half sphere uh, shape. If you look carefully, you see it kind of look like nano flares as well. And of course, once we increase the frequency, this sphere cannot sustain by just being remain static, it starts to spin. And of course, once the frequency change, there's an alteration in frequency, you start to see eruptions, some chaotic process going on in the sphere. It could happen over a short period of time as well. And of course, the spin can change when the frequency change. And of course, uh, anyone who is interested in uh, learn more about this video, you can find it on YouTube. So from here, we learn the properties of uh, what happened in space using um, the vibration of sound. And I will tie this later back to how the electric uh, properties work later on. So in this case, we look at the internal behavior of this uh, sphere. We start to observe that through quantum vibrations, it's a rise of spherical shape with circulation and convection properties. And if you look at the sun, we see the exact same way. We see uh, meridional circulations uh, inside the sun. And of course, it has this thing seems to have explosion and ejection. It's very really similar to the way the sun behaves, that is having active regions and coronal mass ejection. So I believe what happened is there's some frequencies that ties into such uh, activities of the sun. And if you look into external behavior, we see that the sun spin, uh, just like the way this spherical ball have rotation. And of course, it's, it produces, it seems like ejecting mass, just like the sun does. And of course, it looks like a Parker spiral in a larger scale. And this can be compared to um, one of the Al Almar telescope uh, that observed the red giant star, R. Scoptorius. And of course, last but not least, uh, one of the properties that we can observe is a standing wave. And this is, a, this is the mode that I would like to talk about today. <clears throat> and this mode really resembles uh, the orbital plane of the solar system. And if you want to look back into time um, to other, so, other star system, you start to see a, a, a resonant ring um, that's observed in how Tori protoplanetary disk and of course, uh, we go into conclusion here, observations. Uh, of course, change in vibration frequency creates various type of activities um, that's applied to objects in space. Such activity matches with the characteristic of the sun and the, and the, and the solar system, part of it. 
And of course, the organization of matter is resulting of vacuum vibration. It could be done at resonant frequency. So that's how we reinforce the energy into uh, condensing it into the matter. Uh, we can call that order arise from chaos. And of course, energy used to create and sustain the sphere alone ultimately come from the surrounding. And of course, there's two types of wave patterns that we can observe uh, from the previous experiments. Uh, one is a spin, which is a spiral wave, and the other is a standing wave. And I will pay more attention to uh, the standing beha be behavior. So such uh, standing wave behavior can be observed by experiment, a uh, simple experiment just as this one, which is a plasma discharge tube. So by having vacuum and producing, uh, ejecting high voltage into the electrodes, you start to see columns of plasma. And that looks pretty much like a, um, it's a periodic uh, structure when it starts to stabilize. So now it becomes stabilized in the video. You start to see a lot of columns, just like we observed in uh, the autory, autopanetry this. So next, we extend this understanding, but it may be a little harder to do in plasma, so we go back to a uh, solid, solid model using sound wave again. So now we take a look at how we can create an organized system using sound wave. And this is, a, uh, this is an experiment called center, circular center clanny plate, which you can uh, check online as well. So in this case, we have a plate, a solid plate. A center is tied to the speaker below. Um, we put a lot of small particles as as we change the frequency, those particles, they automatically organize around the center uh, of the focus point. And this looks pretty much like an asteroid belt. So um, by increasing the frequency, you start to see that the, the matters or that scattering around this plate start to be more uh, fine and create a more defined uh, circle, such as the one shown here. So the more frequency you put in, the more rings it creates. So it, for me, it looks really much like our solar system. So we move to the next slide, uh, more three-dimensional view relies on Argon National Labs uh, using acoustic levitation. Uh, in this case, of course, uh, we see that uh, we put a spherical foam and it seems like it's suspended over the air. So you see, notice the vibration that occur in these spheres. Of course, the sphere will be uh, in the node where it's the most stable and of course, it moves with frequencies. So it looks pretty much like our solar system. In our case, we want to study about how the sun translate power, transmit power into the Earth. And of course, if it looks really similar to these things, what we should observe is that if the sun vibrates, then the planets will vibrate. Simple as that. But what kind of vibration is this? Um, we talk, we all talk, I have talked about uh, longitude wave all, all along, so I want to continue uh, in this mode of propagation. So we construct a model of resonant coupling in the solar system. Uh, we assume the sun is the center of solar system, and of course, through standing wave effects, the Earth's probably in the third node of uh, vibration. So we've assumed um, the distance is about 149.6 million kilometers away, and assume this mode of propagation travel about speed of light. 
So that's eight time, three times eight, 10 to the power of eight meters per second. So that turns out to be about three millihertz of vibration. So what's important about this frequency? If we take a look at the hill seismic activity, uh, this is using golf instruments. Um, this is instrument installed in Soho. So what uh, we measure is the P mode is acoustic pressure wave of the sun at the surface of the sun. And we, at that time, the scientists want to look into interior of the sun. And what they have found is the resonant frequency of such mode occur right around three millihertz. And uh, in general terms, um, field physicists like to call this a five minutes oscillation. So, and of course, what happened on Earth, it might be really difficult to detect such frequency vibration. It has to be excited um, to a large event such as earthquake. So, in this case, we look at the earthquakes, uh, the great Chilean earthquakes happened in 1960. And of course, uh, what we observed is about the same frequency spectrum occur when the earthquakes occur. So we have hello seismic uh, monitoring station uh, spread across the globe and measuring the, how the Earth is vibrates according to the stimulation. And we found uh, one of the fundamental modes fall between one to five millihertz. And of course, such vibration doesn't end here. It goes into the comet as well. Uh, in comet Helbovs, uh, scientists have observed uh, interaction uh, of comets with the surrounding plasma right around the same frequency. In this case, the coma will have uh, the same vibration frequency around about three, four, two to three uh, millihertz. Actually, it should be like two to about four millihertz but with the center around this frequency. So next, if we understand that how vibration actually interacts, I mean, how the energy interacts amongst the objects in space in the solar system, we should be able to construct a model of energy transmission based on resonance system. So it relies on Tesla invention, uh, one of the uh, power transmission of his patent is filed in May 15, 1900. So it consists of two sphere, two ball of sphere, conductive sphere. Inside can be dielectrics, and, and of course it ties to uh, a great spiral to the pole of this thing. So we call this the sun and the earth. And of course, by having a, a generator uh, ties to the primary, start to see, um, I, I did uh, a laboratory experiment on this. So in this case, we have the generator, which is sit at the center of this um, video here. I cannot simulate three millihertz vibration, so I use three megahertz, about one billion times higher in frequency. 50% uh, duty cycle is in a square wave. And of course, this thing connected to the primary side of the transformer, which in this case can represent something coming out from the galaxy. From the galaxy. And of course, there's a spiral, um, flat spiral core connect to the, uh, the core of the sphere. And of course, one side goes into the secondary and go to the pole of another sphere. And of course, we tap the power from the outside core, and that's go to an LEDs. In this case, I use six LEDs. Uh, please notice the brightness of the LEDs because uh, we're gonna do some, playing some interaction here. So there's four different types of, of things you can do with the system to modulate the power. One is to modulate the, the potential or power of this generator. Second, see the LEDs? When we change the frequency, of course, this LEDs uh, doesn't light up. It's only light up when it's peak. 
So at, at resonance, at three megahertz, at other resonant frequency, at other frequency, it doesn't match us with this characteristic. So another way to modulate the power is to detune the capacitor, which is the spherical ball here. I use my hand as a demonstration. So when the, I have a hand or something that move approach the spherical ball, you see the LEDs start to dim. So it can modulate the power of the transmitter side. For example, if this ball, if hand represent a CME, it passed through the earth, you start to see um, fluctuation of these LED lights as well. So this uh, ball can represent an open, open plate capacitor. If you have some secondary effects, uh, secondary plate will be formed automatically in space, and of course, it can be altered from, from the external environment. From these observations, uh, I've observed four major approaches to modulate the Earth's electrical environment. Uh, one is to modulating the entire solar system, uh, galactic generator amplitudes. Second is to modulate the galactic generator frequency. And that's ties to how the variation of 11 years solar cycle. The third is to change the plasma environments around the local generator sphere, it's called the sun either through celestial body passage, just like how the comet approached the sun. Of course, we also observe some heliocentric planetary alignment seems to have some effects on solar activities, as well as other types of alignments of bodies in space. And the third, uh, sorry, the fourth is the change in the plasma environment in the local receiver sphere through wave propagations, one is to long shoot and transverse wave. Uh, we're going to also have particles propagation that modulates the uh, upper atmosphere, such as coronal mass ejection and solar wind. And also, of course, if there's a uh, heliocentric alignments, they have to be geocentric alignments because the Earth is considered another resonant uh, cavity. And of course, some a significant celestial body passage could affect some electrical properties around the Earth. So that's called a local change in plasma environment. Uh, from here, uh, this is another, just something I can show you, that when the comets approach the sun, of course you got the eruption occur. So I believe this is something due to the cavity being detuned due to the plasma environment change. Just so just like the way I put the, my hand close to the spherical ball, so the capacitor is detuned, the whole circuit is detuned. So from, us, this, from these all observations, now all the properties allow all types of plasma wave to exist in space, in addition to electromagnetic one, which is uh, electrostatic. And of course, uh, the thing that I want to address uh, is the one that have no magnetic field. So for, for the electromagnetic wave propagation, uh, it's called B, the vector B here, there's none for electromagnetics or light wave. But for the electrostatics, now there's something exists that could explain a lot of phenomena which cannot be explained using a conventional understanding, such as um, ion acoustic wave, plasma oscillation, and that I believe this exists in space as well. And I'm going to show you some um, evidence of existence of such a wave in terms of the connection with the natural disaster, the thing that has been done in the past six years. First, we go to the case study of the Nepal earthquake. Magnitude of 7.8 occurred on March 21st. Sorry, March 25th, 2015. During that time, if you track the sunspot number, we see that the sunspot reached 10 weeks local maximum on March 19, approximately, March 2019. And of course, um, we observed change in climates during that time. Uh, those who live in the equator, uh, I tracked uh, the temperature during the time, it's extremely hot. Uh, near equator, 
about 24 to 48 hours before the earthquakes. And those who have uh, observed such thing, you know that uh, earthquakes has a strong tie to uh, sudden change in the weather. Of course, in the near epicenter, we see extreme cold and windy condition, uh, if you ask the Nepal people, uh, before, right before the earthquakes. If you look in space, what we see is a strong coronal mass ejection occur um, between March 20 to March 23rd. We got M4 uh, X-ray flares on March 21st. And of course, low level of geomagnetic storm. If we understand uh, such connection, the geomagnetic storm can be either ineffective in terms of understanding the, this connection. And of course, during that time, we observed uh, geocentric alignment between Earth, Mercury, and Mars. We look into the timelines of how this all natural disaster arise. Uh, we start from April 21st. We observed uh, non-Earth directed coronal mass ejection. So again, the coronal mass ejection in this model is a symptom of the fluctuation in resonant frequency. It's happened to be right at the peak of the sunspot. So it highlighted in the yellow area here. And of course, during that time, we have a Nepal foreshock magnitude of 5.1 earthquakes. We have a great volcanic eruption in Chile, uh, largest eruption in many years. And of course, we followed by another CMEs. You can see that um, all these events happen almost simultaneously, just like a tr travel at speed of light. And of course, about three days later, we observed uh, the main shock, uh, earthquake in Nepal, magnitude of 7.8. The three days period, it matches with the speed of the solar wind travel from the sun to the earth. So the next case study is one of the really famous uh, case. Uh, it's a Japan earthquake between March 7 to March 11, 2011. What's special about this case is that if you look at the sunspot number graph on, on the top, you see that's the highest sunspot number in the last two years. It, and it also, not only that, it rises up rapidly, almost exp exponentially, in the past 30 days. So this is highly significant events to pay attention to. And it reached the maximum on March 8. During March 7, of course, we see a massive coronal mass ejection, as well as uh, we see expansion of coronal holes start from March 7 through March 10. If many of us uh, read some literature, we also see ionospheric heating around this time frame before the earthquakes in Japan. And of course, um, there's a foreshock happens almost simultaneously within the day uh, of the high solar activity events uh, in, in terms of sunspots. You see uh, Japan foreshock around 7.1 magnitudes and then about three days later, you got a main shock of earthquakes, magnitude of 9.1. So again, it matches with the speed of solar wind. But again, um, if we pay attention only to the direction of CMEs, some, some must may have missed such an opportunity to predict the earthquake. And the last but not least is if something happened during the maximum, there's always something going to happen during the minimum. In this case, uh, in December 23rd, between September 23rd to 24th, 2004, Sunspot has reached the 10 weeks extreme minimum around December 17 to December 28th. If you look at the coronal mass ejection, um, it become the most extreme and the most intense on the 23rd of December. 
Again, it's non-Earth-directed CME. And of course, if you look into the coronal hole uh, data, you see a sudden expansion of coronal holes facing the Earth during that time. And it starts around the 24th of December. If you zoom into the graph, you see the same thing, same pattern repeated. You got CMB precursor, global far shock occur on the 23rd. And of course, the main shock follow two and a half days later. So we got two effects here. One is a simultaneous uh, reaction between the sun and the earth, pretty much approaching the speed of light. And the other is the propagation that takes about two to four days afterwards. So conclusion here is that I propose a theory of quantum vibrations and in relation to solar system formation. Uh, such theory may help explain various characteristics of the sun and its surrounding space, as well as understanding how the Earth interacts with the surrounding. Um, the evidence of quantum vibration can be found in hill seismic activities and geoseismic activities, as well as comet interaction with solar wind. Of course, it suggests that the longitude wave is, exists in space, uh, in both vacuum and plasma, and um, there's a engineer that has proved that um, the speed of light, uh, the longitude wave has trouble at speed of light, uh, which are going to be mentioned uh, later. Next slide. And of course, the earthquake, I'm talking about a very strong, significant earthquake or high frequency earthquake that happened during one some day. It seems to be a direct evidence of longitude energy vibration in space. And of course, longitude power coupling, strong earthquake can occur without the presence of geomagnetic storm. And this solved the mystery of why we see strong earthquake when there's no geomagnetic storm in some cases. I would like to uh, thank to the Thunderbolt projects for providing me the opportunity to present this work. And, um, Beach Metros, who is the first person who made me aware of the connection uh, through his website, the National Disaster Report. Uh, Stan Ayo, who have done a lot of uh, resonant vibration uh, experiments. Same thing for Nassim Herman. Musa Abdullahi, he's provides the radical verification of longitude wave in space, and you can find his proof, uh, mathematical proof, in his uh, website. Ben Davison, um, he provide a great public outreach to the world, so make the public aware of the such connection of the space weather and all things that change on Earth. And of course, the several YouTubers who have done a wonderful job in uh, doing, uh, reporting all the solar activities, reporting all the Earth changes, things that's going on, so that everyone's aware that we are more than just the Earth, and we are all connected to everything in our solar system and also our galaxy and our universe. And thank you very much for your attention.